are listening to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm your host, Peter Banatini. Here I interview brain scientists of all types and discuss their work as well as the latest developments, controversies, findings, and challenges in the field of brain mapping. And today's guest is a very special guest for me. It's Dr. Eric Wong, a professor at the University of California, San Diego. And uh, in the context of uh, a few episodes ago of talking with Ravi Menon and Ken Kwong and Bob Turner about the history of fMRI and some of the developments, I wanted to actually, I was looking forward to bringing up Eric because uh, at least for me, for my own career, he was probably the most important person to get that going. Uh, because at the Medical College of Wisconsin, he really got fMRI going uh, by building the necessary hardware. We had to build local head grading coil out of pseudo pipe and wire. Um, he designed it, he built it, he wrote the echoplanar pulse sequences uh, and developed the recon for echoplanar before these things were well understood. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the story of how that happened. Uh, he's been pretty much a, a creative force in the field of MRI for, for many years. Uh, he went on from hardware to, to work with, when he was at San Diego, to work with Rick Buxton and, and uh, Tom Liu and some of the people there on uh, you know helping them with understanding bold contrast. He worked with a neuroscientist there as well, to some degree, but he also um, developed perfusion imaging. He developed uh, velocity selective arterial spin labeling. He developed uh, vascular territory mapping. Um, so he's been creating in the field of MRI and MRI pulse sequences uh, with bold and perfusion for years. And uh, uh, since then, uh, in the last maybe five years, he switched gears a little bit to delve into uh, understanding the brain. So he's he decided to focus on computational neuroscience, sort of doing simulations uh, to try to understand how the brain uh, processes information using, once again, first principles of, of uh uh, neuronal firing rates and uh, recovery times, uh, and, go, and building those into uh, attractors and networks, and so on. So we can we'll, we're going to talk a lot about that as well. Uh, so just to have a little bit of background, uh, Eric uh, received his bachelor's from the University of California, San Diego, in biophysics in 1985. Uh, he received his PhD from the Medical College of Wisconsin in 1981. And he was also part of the uh, at what's called the MSTP program there, the Medical Scientist Training Program. So he also received an MD in 1994. He's not a practicing MD. He is a physicist who does uh, uh, research. Uh, so uh, he came back after finishing up at the Medical College, he came back to the University of San Diego, uh, 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 University of California, San Diego in uh, right after, in, in about 1995, I believe, and uh, he's been there ever since. So, uh, like I said, he's been my very, very good friend for many, many years, for over 30 years, and this has been this was a treat to talk to him about uh, about his career path, about some of the stories about the early days of fMRI, and uh, how it was back then and also about his recent work in computational neuroscience. Uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation. Today, uh, I have Eric Wong on, on our podcast and uh, welcome, Eric. Thanks, Peter, and thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for coming on. I'm, I, you know, Eric, uh, you're, you know, obviously, uh, a great friend of mine, you know, I've known you for since about 1990, 1990 or 1989. And, uh, and I've been lucky enough to be, uh, you know, friends with you and in close contact 
continuously all the way through. And I just wanted to, to maybe start this podcast with, so, so a couple of weeks ago I had, and this will, this probably either has or already will come out, a good discussion with uh, Ravi Menon and, and Bob Turner uh, and Ken Kwong about the beginning of fMRI. And one, one person that was sort of missing from all that discussion, at least from my perspective, uh, with, within the context of what I did, was, was you. Since, uh, in my opinion, you know, everything back at MCW was Medical College of Wisconsin was, uh, you know, certainly I had a, a passion and I was just a graduate, first year graduate student who kind of wanted to somehow figure out a way to look at brain function with MRI. And I was looking at, you know, chemical shift imaging, I was looking at IVIM with, the, with Libby Han using, you know, the wrong sequences that were too noisy. And I remember early in my graduate career, actually first, very early, I think even when I was interviewing, I first met you and little did I know that uh, working with you would be so absolutely essential uh, to getting fMRI off and running at MCW with what you did with your pulse sequences, what you did with the grading coil. And I think you were working on the grading coils at the time I met you, like wrist coils. So it'd be fun just to recap that a little bit. I mean, I don't know if you remember our first meeting. Yeah, I walked into your office and you had all these coils and you're and I was just already blown away by the fact that you had these little pieces of sewer pipe with wire and you're talking to GE about how to interface them. And I was like, thinking, this is really cool. Uh, yeah, so I, had, I had a grading coil sitting on my shelf. Um, I remember you walking into my office. I think shortly after a run, I remember you being unusually sweaty <laughs> when, you, when you walked in. I was uh, sweaty a lot. I mean, somebody was already, I think just the other day, somebody made fun of me for giving a talk and I was sweating profusely. And, and uh, I was thinking I was just after a run. So, um, yeah, so that was back in the back in the days when I was working on gradient coils specifically, actually for perfusion related imaging stuff, but um, with the goal of uh, doing uh, sort of these, these comb shaped ultra thin slices to, to get at uh, motion and get to get a perfusion and also to, to uh, get a diffusion, which was, you know, just being, uh, which was just recently introduced by Libby Han and was, was coming up. So, um, yeah, so the grading coil design stuff ended up being, you know, sort of the focus of my dissertation, sort of the range of things that you could do with local grading coils at the time. But yeah, the, the early uh, applications were perfusion, diffusion, and, uh, and you know, bold fMRI had not, had not yet come on the scene. But as you know, we, you know, we had tools sort of ready to go when, when the fMRI uh, news officially like first broke. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, I mean, it's interesting also to look at the climate at the time, you know, back then. You know, their echo planer kind of existed. I mean, I remember seeing movies with, you know, looking at um, uh, what was the company that uh, advanced NMR. Yeah, 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 like Anamar, Anamar, um, mm -hmm. right with uh, Robert Weisskopf, and yep. you know, they were doing cardiac imaging, and and not many people, in my opinion, were in the area of sort of pulse programming. I mean, there's there are a few. I mean, there was the Stanford group was developing their pulse sequences, but and and some groups were doing that, but I just felt that you sort of were plugged into that really well, and you were just coming up with with uh, various different strategies for for pulse sequences, but also also interfacing the coils to actually be able to get more out of the, the pulse sequences as well. Um, yeah, I thought yeah. like all that stuff was actually you know echo planar was was invented by Peter Mansfield. I think it was nineteen seventy seven or something like that. You know, gradient coils were well obviously had been around, but, and conceptually, you know, a small grading coil was actually not that big a deal. It's like, you know, it just built the same thing smaller. You know, we worked on, I uh, worked on some, you know, numerical optimization, stuff like that to, to just make things, make the fields better and stuff like that. But, you know, conceptually it's not, it wasn't anything weird. Um, so, but so to me, it seemed actually pretty straightforward to just put the pieces together, you know, pulse programming is just another programming language. So, Getting EPI together was was conceptually straightforward. You know, building a small gradient coil was con conceptually straightforward, and it just happened to have the right motivation to get those pieces together at the at the right time. And I remember also, I mean, even before even before fMRI began, even before we were really working together to you know to get this going, I actually felt you know I, it's funny because I was sort of you know adrift, and I and I and I saw you, and I and I thought oh, this guy really, you know, it, one one thing that the that was unique, I, I believe, about about you, and it still is, is that um, you sort of try to think of things as much as possible in a sort of, you know, sort of first principle sort of way, that's sort of a cliche statement, but it's really, you know, sort of 
not just sort of repeating some, you know, just actually understanding things at a deep level, but also most importantly is that you were really patient uh, with me and you still are, you know, I'd ask, I'd constantly ask these questions that were sort of naive and sometimes ask them over and over again. And, you know, after a while, most people sort of just kind of brush you off a little bit, but you're very, I think somewhere along the line, you um, came to value uh, sort of being patient and communicating clearly as possible, which, which has really helped me as far as many other things, as far as what I do. And so uh, I think that combination actually made, uh, I think even more so uh, us a good team at the time. Part, part of that is that I, I, I think I realized pretty early on that, that my strength is not really in really deep multi-level layers of abstraction, you know, like, like what a, like what a mathematician a serious mathematician does that that my strength are more in looking more horizontally more broadly and integrating things you know something across fields and uh and going back to like you said going back to first principles and re you know constantly asking myself what what is it about what i think that that's wrong and integrating things across yeah more horizontally than 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 deep so yeah that's that's and that's where i you know end up like as you know these these fields that we've been in are, are very interdisciplinary and, uh, and uh, I, yeah, I love that, that aspect. Definitely. So anyway, so, so with the, with the story though, as, as it went and, and as I talked about with Ken and everyone, you know, Tom Brady, I was looking around and we were, I was working with you and um, it was interesting before that, I, that's that meeting in San Francisco in August of 1991, I was working with you to help you out uh, with your, you actually were developing this, really interesting sequence that have had two comb excitations and you had it running on a small grading coil. Uh, you needed echo planar, but you really wanted to do have a demonstration on a person for your poster. And so, you know, it almost seemed like a, as a, on a whim, but not really on a whim, but you said, well, you know, ISMRM is coming up. We have to build a head, local head grading coil. And, and, and we took over the, the machine shop for like a weekend. And uh, it was, it seemed like it was kind of a strange, it, it, you know, it seemed like it was a scene out of like, you know, nowhere, no, nowhere near like it, but it was kind of like risky business where, um, <laughs> where, where we, we kind of like completely destroyed the machine shop and then put it all back together again. It was almost perfect when we were done, but there was one piece of epoxy on the floor and, and the person who's in charge of it kind of came back on Monday. And it's like, Hey, wait a second. <clears throat> There's some epoxy here. What happened? <laughs> So yeah, so that was a that was I, I I like to tell that story where I mean what so what did you so you designed it uh, using your conjugate gradient descent algorithm that you worked on for your thesis on your next computer right right as a graduate student I spent uh, a, a third of my annual stipend on a on a, on a privately bought next computer <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a, <laughs> a good, good choice in retrospect. But um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of the early work was uh, numerical optimization of uh, gradient coils. So you know, a lot of the methods that were out there were these actually, I would say, conceptually more interesting things like target fields approaches and stuff like that. But you know, I figured you could just let the computer move the wires around until the fields got better, and that turns out to be uh, true. So so that's where the the early designs came from. And yeah, I had I had this. Uh, like I said, comb-shaped excitation approach for perfusion imaging, which turned out to be not a good way of doing perfusion imaging. It was a, it was a very good motion detector, uh, it turns out. But, you know, we had demonstrations on on this uh, four-inch diameter coil and, you know, in a rabbit. And I thought, yeah, for, for ISMRM, it would be good to to at least demonstrate the, the that the approach is, you know, works sort of in principle in a human. So, so we just scaled up this, the same construction process got a you know got a bigger sewer pipe instead of a smaller sewer pipe and pounded the copper wires into the into the fiberglass and epoxy <laughs> and both my wife Denise and you were brave enough to actually get in it <laughs> with just velcro holding it down onto the onto yep. the uh, the table and yep. fortunately it was it was in fact torque balanced like it was supposed to be and didn't fly off the table uh <laughs> didn't but twist you first scan it out you first scan an apple i have to say yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, the apple, and then this, I think number I think number two was my wife Denise, and yep. then I think number three was you. I think so. I think so. And uh, and I think you first tried echo planer with with a phantom before yep. before putting a head into as well. But uh, yep. it was a it was a huge amount of work. And I think what came before that as well is that 
it, it, there was no standard echoplanar sequence out there. So you just modified, you know, flash sequence and sort of wrote all the reconstruction yourself, which I, if I recall, was hard. I mean, you had to figure it out, phase shifting and, and phase correction. Uh, yeah, I mean, every, you know, all, everybody was trying to figure it out at the time. The echoplanar sequence itself was was well worked out, but, you know, things like uh, like phase corrections and timing shifts and stuff like that were, you know, it was, it was early days for that. So um, so we, we implemented a, you know, straightforward, but uh, pretty robust a phase correction to get rid of Nyquist ghosts. And, and actually, you know, to be honest, it, it kind of worked largely because when you have a tiny gradient coil and actually it turned out to be quite good linear amplifiers uh, that were on the system, the, the gradient fidelity was actually incredibly high right off the bat. We had like, you know, the, the coil had uh, an inductance that was 20 times lower than a, a body coil. So it was actually super easy to drive. Uh, and the amplifiers could be tuned in a relatively straightforward way. We got help from GE tuning the uh, tuning the feedback loop of the amplifiers so that they worked well. So they were actually, you know, incredibly linear right off the bat. In fact, I remember mapping the grading trajectories for the very first spiral that we implemented, the single shot spiral, just I think a year or two later with that same grading coil. And, um, you know, the, fide the, the fidelity of the, of the measured case-based trajectory was, was incredibly, incredibly good. Yeah, no, the coil was amazing because, and it was right. Like you said, it was very stable, minimal eddy currents. Uh, and I also like how, you know, you, when you were designing the, uh, made the RF coil, you know, I, I liked how you kept on saying, well, I don't really, you know, not sure what I'm doing, but uh, it seems like it's working and, and, it, and it worked great. I mean, obviously the RF coil is a little bit more challenging because it was so close to the inside of the coil, but the grading coil, but um uh, you know, you had an innovation of using an end cap, which which seemed to help, and uh, it was really purely a nuts and bolts creation. Yeah, all the little bits like the the RF shield. Uh, yeah, like you said, the the RF coil is very close to the grading coil, so it has to be shielded from that. The grading coil was not shielded from anything on the outside. In fact, it just you know it just happened. It was just small enough that it didn't interfere with the whole body system or get interference from the whole body system at all. Whole body system was was open circuited anyways, um, but the whole the whole thing didn't need any eddy current compensation at all. And then on the inside, you know, we had to bootstrap our way to figuring out how to make an RF shield that didn't cause eddy currents, and and uh, you know, build a as you said an end capped bird cage coil that that you know made decent fields even though it was in a very confined space. Yeah, no, I remember you know making many many trips back and forth and back and forth. The scanner was far away from the you know about a half mile walk under the underground to the uh, the scan room from the biophysics department and and uh, going back and forth and we didn't have you know we didn't have internet I mean we had it was sort of before the internet in some sense we we had to save everything on uh, initially it was real to real tape and and uh, yeah. uh, and then we, I, I remember having to go to GE because they had a tape reader that converted to then a hard drive and then saving it onto like one of those mo drives or something like that so yeah it was crazy um, actually working through that process. <laughs> I, sh I should mention to, uh, especially to any young listeners who might be out there, don't, don't do this at home. Um, Cause you know, this, the, the, like we, you know, we, we didn't know that the coil was not going to melt. Um, we didn't know that it, that, were, that the wires weren't going to break out of the fiberglass shell. I mean, they, they didn't. And yes, we did test it on a, on a phantom beforehand, but there's, you know, there's no cooling, there's no uh, regulations at all. <laughs> um, so so it, it's, uh, it, it's, it would, it would not be, it would not be uh, doable today and it would not be um, uh, recommended, but, but, you know, we were uh, lucky enough that, that um, our estimates of what would be robust turned out, turned out to be uh, correct. Yeah. And that brings up an actually interesting question. You know, it would be absolutely impossible today and, and for good reasons for the most part. I mean, it's like you said, it's risky. It's slightly risky. You knew what you were doing enough and we were fortunate, but how, you know, is that something that potentially is stifling some of the innovation? I mean, obviously there, you can do it on phantoms and you can, you can test it out extensively and probably that's the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no way yeah, uh, in this day and age, we would ever be able to. I mean, it, we wouldn't even be able to get that coil even in the scanner with a phantom, much less with a person. Uh, right. 
and even the same with RF foils. You know, the the, um, the there's a lot more regulation as, as I think there should be. For, uh, I mean, even on RF foils, but let alone gradient coils, and even pulse sequences too. I mean, who knows? Uh, you know, with, but what's interesting, actually, just as a side note, I'm just jumping around a little bit, is that after we developed this gradient coil, we were worried about you know obviously blowing up the gradient amplifiers with without it if you used echo planar just with the standard gradient amplifiers. But it turns out that, you know, when you finally went to San Diego, you didn't have a gradient coil, but you had, you want to do equiplater imaging. You want to do function right, right away. You realize, oh, if, if you're, if you're happy to put up with lower resolution images, 10 millimeters instead of three millimeters, then you can do equiplater on a standard back to back then it was 1.5 Tesla Cigna scanner with the hundred amplifier, hundred, hundred um, amps gradient amplifier. So you could do it. Yeah, it was kind of funny. It turns out that it, and it wasn't even that bad. It was it was five millimeter resolution. Five millimeters. Okay, yeah. that's pretty you, good. Right, right. You can just do it. Yeah, you yeah, can no, just, yeah. yeah. I actually don't quite understand why. Well, I mean, I, I don't understand why people didn't do that at the time. But but just vanilla EPI on the stock, you know, GE Signa one point five P scanners of the day would do five millimeter EPI perfectly fine. Yeah. And yeah. you know, for for the very earliest, you know, the lowest hanging fruit questions in fMRI, that works fine. It, it might have been, it might been better in some sense because it was, you know, higher signal to noise, and you you, you know you were looking at big blobby areas anyway. Yeah, image distortion was pretty good. You could use a, a better RF coil without mm -hmm. having to use the grading coil, so it could have been better. So it's amazing in retrospect to realize that oh, you know, you think oh the grading coil was key, but in fact we were kind of limited by not thinking through that part as well as we needed to, except then when you had to, when you moved to San Diego early on, yeah, happened. So that was, that's an interesting story. I always, like, <laughs> I'd like to tell as well. I mean, you also designed, I actually, I always, there was a, there was actually a time period uh, between when, when we started doing a functional MRI, which was just completely overwhelming to me that I just remember a time period in which I would, Every day I'd come into work, uh, come into lab, typically in the afternoon, because I would be working it in the evening, and then to start talking to you, and you would have it like sort of a, a new idea every day. And and I was amazed. It was inspiring and impressive. And also that you had these new ideas, and then you would try to explain it to me, and I'd sort of understand. But then after talking to you, you would explain it to me, so I did understand. And so that was uh, that was really fun. That was, you know, some people have horrible graduate student experiments, experiences and whatever with, you know, our advisor, we both had the same advisor, Jim Hyde. He was, he's a great, but he also just kind of let us uh, run free in some sense. And he gave guidance, but, and we just kind of like teamed up and, and yeah, it was an incredible, incredibly stimulating experience and a really fulfilling experience. And we were lucky. Yeah, I would say it's I would say it's hard to even call what he did even guidance. He, he you know he 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 was pretty amazing in not putting up any walls at all to to what you were doing. It's more like he would throw out ideas, and he didn't yeah. even care if he didn't if he didn't take them. You know, he would just throw things out and and let people go. And you know, obviously that that doesn't work well for everybody, but but for um, you know people that have that, that have ideas and want to try a lot of different things. It's, it was, it was a, it was an incredible playground. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually I, I remember it's interesting too, because it was, a, it was an awesome playground. You had the hardware, you had, you had various people, you, you didn't have anyone bothering you. You just did what you did. And, and, and the trick was to find something interesting to do. And, and, and he set the environment and you're right. He just would walk down the halls and just see what we're doing and then kind of be kind of curious and, you know, he wasn't sure about fMRI and he was sort of like would mention a few things. And it's funny too, because I, in, I sort of in some way uh, picked up that style in some way. And I remember even as a postdoc when I was uh, at MGH, I mean, uh, you know, Bruce Rosen and various people, they didn't, you know, they weren't like, you know, you have to, but they didn't plug me into a project either. They just like said, we'll just do what we do and I'll give suggestions and this is how it works. And, and that's kind of to this day, this is how I work too. It's like I, people come into my group and I just, we try to figure out something that works, but I just sort of, you know, I think the best way is to give them free reign and have them think on their on their own. I mean, you also do other things. Like I back to my train of thought about coming up with these new things. I mean, you you developed a, a flat grading coil with an isocenter that was raised above the coil, which I still think uh, I don't, you know, it's I, I don't know if that sort of thing has been developed. I don't know if, whether it makes sense anymore, but um, 
you can imagine laying on top of a, of a grading coil that can have X, Y, and Z axes. Uh, and, I, and the design was beautiful. Um, it was, you know, aesthetically beautiful. And uh, yeah, and and so, I mean, I liked how you, you know, the idea of like, oh, let's, you know, I have this graded optimization, let's confine the geometry of the of the leads and then make the isocenter above above the coil. So I don't even know if, did, what, what's that, become of that? Uh, well, th there are other other uh, people that have done that since then. You know, these these raised single single plane raised uh, isocenter grading calls. It's it's you know they're inefficient. They're they're very difficult. But there are some applications. Um, like in fact, there's even a company I believe that's basically doing that for uh, for liver Im uh, not really even li liver imaging, but like liver single point um, spectroscopy, where you you just strap a scanner to your belly and, and, and that kind of thing works. That that particular coil that you're talking about is the one that I think got the biggest laugh that I've ever gotten at giving a talk in ISO. Oh, really? <laughs> because that that was the coil that um, it had all these like crazy loops and stuff in it. And it was built with, with just wire, uh, like all our other grading coils. And somebody after the talk asked how I built that. And I, and I told them the truth, which was what, which is that my wife, Denise, sat in front of the TV winding these wires because she's, you know, she's an uh, amateur jeweler, so she can do that. <laughs> and she sat, she sat uh, in front of the TV for three weeks winding these tiny little coils. Um, and so she, she made it. Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So I'm, you know, right. They're, they're less efficient, but I think they, that would be, you know, something even to right. I'm mean, surprised that more people aren't doing that because it, well, I guess you still have to go into the bore of the magnet, though. So until you can have, imagine, you know, a, a single-sided something. Yeah, you need a one-sided magnet as well. Which is you need a one-sided awesome. magnet as well yeah. to, who knows, someday. So yeah, other ideas too. Like for instance, um, you know, there's certain things that, you know, after I wrote that paper on, on I remember talking to you once again, all these conversations happened by the scanner on, you know, how in the world, so, you know, this sort of averaging and subtracting, and there must be a more efficient way of doing this. And, and obviously there was, uh, and, and you just mentioned, oh, well, let's just do, why not you just do, you know, take the dot product or the correlation. And you know, I thought about that and I'm like, yeah, that's, that makes perfect sense. And, you know, it's like a match filter. And next thing we know, in a couple more, in the next year we had the correlation analysis paper, and I have to attribute yourself for the seed of the idea for that as well. And also, even you know, less known is, you know, I, I was trying my hardest to sort of figure out the best way to simulate this, and because you need to to simulate bold, because it's a large enough scale, you need or small enough scale, you need to simulate diffusion. And I was looking at some of the other simulations that were early on and trying to figure out how to do, one, trying to figure out how to write anything in C or to learn C, but also, um, you know, just how to do random walks. And, and you just, once again, were, list, were talking to me and then you said, well, why not just do, you know, convolution uh, with the Gaussian uh, iteratively to, to do that? I'm like, and I, it was a great idea. And, <laughs> um, and so then we wrote this paper on deterministic diffusion uh, simulations and, and it worked. We didn't need random walks. We just did repeated Gaussian simulations. And I'm, I'd love to pick up on that in some other way too, because it seems like a, a, a computationally more efficient approach. But so, yeah, anyway, but those are, those are all your ideas. And I, I'm very thankful. I'm always thankful for that. And then your career went on. So then our careers went on. I went off to MGH to my postdoc. You went off to San Diego. Yeah. I came back to MCW. Then I went to the NIH in '99, and you sort of helped out with all the fMRI stuff. But then, you know, you kept on going with perfusion imaging, and you made some real innovations. And, and I don't know if you want to talk about so, that. Um, yeah. So UCSD, um, you know, the Rick Buxton uh, was well, he's still there, um, and he he had a lot of influence on 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 me when I got there. He was interested in fMRI, and as you know, he's he's uh, he's got a strong focus on sort of figuring out underlying principles, including those of fMRI. And, and uh, well, in fact, as, as you recognized early on, the large increase in blood flow that comes with, with functional activation, you know, which is, which is the reason for the, the positive bolt signals as, as you, as you, <laughs> as you noted in your, 
lab notebook right the, the day after our first experiment. So that so blood flow was was something that was, that was very much on um, Rick Buxton's mind. Um, arterial spin labeling had just been uh, just recently been invented by um, Detra and Koretsky. So Rick said, you know, we need to do ASL, and, he, and Rick himself, you know, is a he's a little bit more theoretical, less less experimental guy. So he's like. What we really meant is what we we need you to do ASL, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, so that that got me started in the ASL area, both for you know understanding underlying fMRI signals, but also for clinical applications as as well. And uh, so the ASL business sort of took up more or less the next fifteen years or so of my of my career. To me, at least, the the two big contributions in ASL that uh, the least I'm personally most happy about is is a uh, velocity selective stuff as i think you've mentioned you know which is a, a a class that's different than what was out there and and then the whole concept of of vessel encoding where you can sort of surprisingly for basically for free in terms of snr per unit time you can get information on both um perfusion quantitative perfusion and you know what what arteries are supplying what tissues and both of those are I, i'm happy to see that they're they're both actively being pursued by by you know several groups and uh, are within the asl world at least uh you know those are two of the, the main areas that are still getting a lot of attention now. So, so that's that's very gratifying. Just to, just to sidetrack a little bit on ASLs, right? I mean, it seems like there's a lot of information that you can get. You know, a lot of people I talk to sort of still say, well, clinically, you know, gadolinium is still good. You can get perfusion. It's a little bit more sensitive, time, time efficient. But, and it also seems that, and this is a classic problem with fMRI, that companies don't really embrace all the all the variations of the sequence and try to push them clinically as much because there's not it's sort of a chicken and egg thing there's no clinical market necessarily and so they they don't see how there's clear path to you know having this market and so they don't really push it and so it would be really nice to be able to you know because I, I do think that there's a lot of clinical use for what you've and you and other people have done with ASL that's not being used because of this of this sort of barrier uh in some sense with vendors um, yeah so right so the asl was introduced in you know in the early 90s it wasn't until 2015 well starting in 2012 but but published in 2015 that that the basically the core group of asl developers around the world fortunately i mean it's a small it's a relatively small group it's you know a dozen or so labs around the world but unfortunately, we all um, are very cooperative. So in 2015, we put out, um, you know, basically all the big players in ASL put put out a paper that that um, tries to, you know, cut through the the myriad flavors of ASL that were out there and and put out, you know, one set of guidelines for. So this is what you should do for clinical ASL, at least as of right now. And so that I think actually helped quite a bit because now that gave. That gave the vendors a very clear target for what they should be doing as a first ASL implementation, and and then it it makes it so that all the early you know clinical papers that that use ASL are reporting more or less the same you know data from more or less the same sequence, which has been super useful. And actually, right now, uh, sort of a superset of that same group of authors is putting is is putting together a new set of five, I believe. Um, uh, sort of update papers on various aspects of ASL. One of them, one of them is entirely focused on velocity selective ASL. Uh, and I'm, I'm involved in that one, but but um, that will be a set of reviews and recommendations that will be um, coming through the ISMRM journals over the next year or so. So that's another you know major effort to try to keep things moving along in terms of clinical clinical translation. That's that's important. I think that the sensitivity is getting better. And I think, who knows, maybe a higher field will even be good enough to, to, to be used more regularly or even at lower fields. So, so you've been working on that. You've been working maybe a, a little bit with the fMRI people, a little bit with, you know, Rick and Rick Buxton and Tom Liu trying to, you know, extract more information, understand bold better. But it seems that a few years ago, well, I don't even know, three years ago, you sort of decided to shift gears a little bit um, and it seems like it's building up momentum where, where to my surprise and, and to my happiness or because it's close to brain imaging again, or, or fMRI again in some sense, but even beyond it, is that you decided to shift gears towards more theoretical modeling 
of brain function. And so why yeah. why did that happen? And I think around 2013 or 14 or so, basically the time we were putting together those, the recommendations for a clinical ASL, two main things happened for, for me. One was that I, I sort of felt that the main conceptual um, that sort of the, the sort of the conceptual space for ASL was more or less filled out. That that the what remained technically was mostly translational stuff, which I, I personally am just less good at. And there's there's plenty of people that are good at that. So I, I sort of felt like my contribution to ASL was mostly done. And at the same time, you know, there's for for the history of of MRI before that, it, there was basically the idea that the MR signal was was tied to pixel values by by the Fourier transform, and that was that was sort of a you know rock solid concept for the first fifteen years or twenty years of of MRI, but then several things came up that made that no longer the case. I mean, there's there's a you know compressed sensing and sort of model based reconstructions. There's parallel imaging that says that you don't need all the case space. Um, more recently, there's machine learning things that that say you don't. You also need much less data, and so all those things together was saying to me that it didn't make sense for the fMRI business to be to be just the business of acquiring data as fast as you can, Fourier transforming them into into a, a block, a 4D block of you know X Y Z time voxels, and then handing them off to neuroscientists. What what I thought would make sense is that all these new techs techniques would um, you know, should be rethought so that the so that coming out the other the, you know the the other side of the fMRI acquisition process was not just a pile of pixels, but was data that was specifically aimed at answering neuroscientific questions or trying to decide between neuroscientific hypotheses. Um, and that sort of brought me to starting to look at well, what are those hypotheses? <laughs> yeah. um, because you know, I, I sort of was was just sort of assuming that on the other side of the fence in neuroscience land, that there was you know some handful of of you know I just imagined that there's this handful of clearly laid out uh, hypotheses about how the brain, particularly about how the brain computes, that 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 people are trying to decide between. And it, to my surprise, it seemed more like there's a lot of theories about how things relate to each other in in the brain, um, but there was actually the neuroscience field in general is pretty dramatically data heavy and and I would say theory light in that uh, there's not a, there's not a bunch of competing core theories about how the brain computes it's more like we know a whole bunch about about what the brain does and we have a whole bunch of observations but the core computation is actually just plain not understood and that really surprised me and so over the over the next few years uh, my personal interest just shifted from you know what can fMRI do for neuroscience to can an, an outsider to neuroscience maybe help throw in a few ideas about what the brain might be doing at, at its core? And I actually specifically thought that, you know, an, that an older <laughs> scientist who's, who is an outsider might actually be, you know, not a bad person to, to, to ask those questions. You know, because yeah. younger people uh, that, are, that, are, that are, you know, that are getting into the field, they're, they're guided by, you know, all the dogma that's that's in in whatever subfield that they choose and they also really don't have the freedom to to sort of think very high level very broadly and throw it throw out ideas that are very high risk because they have to they have to establish a career you know in neuroscience which is as you know is this behemoth of of a field especially especially coming from mri where the world of mri research is a few thousand people and you know the world of neuroscience is in order of magnitude larger than that, at least, you know. So you have to worry as a young scientist about carving out carving out niches and stuff like that. Whereas somebody who's <laughs> closer to the end of their career than the beginning, you know, might have a little more f freedom to just review things, come from the outside, and, and hopefully throw in some new ideas. Yeah, it, it is interesting how you know there's this you know like with any you know getting a PhD, it's like there's it's like a craft where you you know you do your you know four years of learning and and coming up with something and then maybe a few years postdoc and then you're you're whatever that is. And even even if you, you know, like for instance, if you're trying to be if you're trying to do research in another field and learning the necessary things, it's like you're still somewhat of an outsider more so than if you took the path of getting a PhD and but it seems that like what you said, like with neuroscience there 
So, you know, at least that's one thing that I've been slightly frustrated with, with fMRI. I mean, I, I think that with fMRI, it's amazing. You can look at dynamics, signal changes, and you can look at, you know, with resting states, you can, and, and we're understanding how different areas communicate with behavior, but it's all, you know, relatively low resolution, kind of slow, and it's more descriptive of the areas. And, you know, you're right. I think that's what everyone and what you're getting right at is that what everyone really wants is sort of a principle by, by how the brain works. What what are the principles? What are the from at all levels, at all scales? Uh, and we're and we realize we're, you know, we really haven't even begun to to penetrate that type of thing. I mean, with SFN, there's you know people studying, you know, people well modeled, you know, action potentials all the way up to other sort of interactions, but. And all these areas don't really, all these disciplines don't really talk to each other as much, but you thought, okay, well, maybe I'll shift. And you're in a good enough position that you can shift, you're established, you can still, you know, you can do MRI in your sleep practically. And so you don't really have to pay that much. I mean, you still do it and you still collaborate and you still, seems like you help run the center. Uh, but right now you're, most of your energies seem like they're focused on like simulations. Right. So most of my energy is, is now focused on what I guess I would call computational neuroscientists. And, and I'm particularly interested in human specific intelligence, like, you know, what, what the computational basis of that is. And one of my main opinions is that is the human intelligence is, you know, it's qualitatively different from, you know, the, the, the billion years of evolution that, that brought us, you know, brought us up to things like you know, animals like dogs, that um, a, a lot of, well, the vast majority of neuroscience is is, is actually looking at the, the very difficult problem of trying to figure out, is trying to disentangle that, that billion years of evolution and figuring out how these very complicated circuits do, you know, do visual object recognition, do motor control and, and all that stuff. You know, the human specific part of intelligence, you know, that's less than a million years old. And in fact, most of it's you know, less than 100,000 years old, and the exponential growth that is, you know, obviously has been just the last few thousand years. And, and I think, so I, I, I personally think that human specific intelligence is both qualitatively different, and I think it's actually much, much simpler in principle than circuits that, that you know, do things like visual object recognition. And I think, it, I, I think one of the biggest pieces of evidence for that is that because of this relatively recent explosion of human intelligence, I think it's, I think it's fairly easy to argue that human intelligence is, is very, very much dominated by what, you know, by knowledge and intelligence that we've accumulated as a, as a species rather than by the intelligence of a single person. I don't think a single person in isolation is, is that much smarter than a single you know, chimp chimpanzee in, in isolation. If you accept that that the you know that our intelligence is is cumulative across the species, then I think that argues very strongly that it's dominated by the ability to pass on intelligence. So if you so and obviously the, the way we pass on intelligence is through is primarily through words. So that 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 many people agree that language is central to our intelligence. But that also means that the intelligence that we have is, you know, it, it as kind of an obvious statement, that means it's describable in words, right? So that, so that means that the things that we've, uh, that, that like our, our intelligence now is very different from the intelligence that you see in, well, basically all deep neural networks in the sense that, you know, deep neural networks are, are, are largely opaque in what they're doing. Our intelligence is is it in fact incredibly transparent. Like we're we're taught that A goes to B, and we remember that A goes to B. We tell our kids that A goes to B, and we write in textbooks that A, A goes to B, <laughs> and, and that remains, you know, forever the form of of those things that we know. So I, I personally think that the human specific aspects of intelligence are actually dominated by just a large uh, associative network that just connects these things that we know. I think that uh, there are simple mechanisms that can, like when we you know, are, are shown some new thing that we didn't see, I think there's simple mechanisms for those, for that thing to be converted into, if you wanna call it an attractor, if you wanna call it an engram or whatever, 
um, into a, I'll call it an attractor, um, into an attractor in our brain. And I think there are simple mechanisms, that, simple known mechanisms that can associate those attractors with one another. And I, I think that a very large uh, network of such attractors is actually both represents our knowledge and operates uh, human intelligence, the human aspects of intelligence. I think that that associative network certainly sits on top of deep networks that do things like uh, visual object recognition, but that that ultimately those sensory processing things, they, they end up just exciting you know, the attractor that says like, oh, there's a, there's a ball in the room. And then the associative network takes over from there and deals with the fact that there's a ball in the room, does, does all the, the, the things that we consciously do. And, and I think there's simple mechanisms that, that sort of explain all that. Right. I mean, it seems that, I mean, some would argue like, you know, there's this continuum before language, right. it's a little bit less efficient. And then, and then when you have language, you can actually group things into categories more easily, work with them more flexibly, and then have that knowledge and expertise sort of distributed over time and, you know, over space and, and more formalized in some sense. Is there something special about, you know, you can imagine a primate having some form of language. Is, is it is it language or is it is it something else uh, that, I mean, and actually, I think, I'm, I'm sort of out of my depth in some sense yeah. talking about this, but uh, I, yeah. I think the thing that had to act that, that had to actually evolve, in, in addition to just the mechanical aspects of um, of language, is so you. I think you have to you have to start with uh, imagination, and what I, what I mean by that is the ability to think about the, the ability to process things that are that are other than you know current sensory input. And I think you know certainly a hundred thousand years ago, by the time people were putting art on cave walls 70,000 years ago, uh, people have imagination. Most people argue that, that you know, close to a million years ago, when you start whacking at rocks to make sharp stone tools, that's the beginning of imagination because you have to picture this round rock turning into, um, you know, a sharp rock. And, and so I think imagination slowly evolved from about a million years ago and, and then became more and more sophisticated so that, uh, you know, to about a hundred thousand years ago where it, it became significantly more sophisticated. So imagination has to evolve. Um, it has to come with some sort of safety mechanism, either societal or physical, like you know, sitting in a cave that that allows you to to be disconnected from that, that allows you to not be vigilant, but that allows you to be disconnected from the physical present, so that you can your mind can wander off into these places without you being eaten by a bear whatever and you know that that's the mechanism that is that is now you know people are putting a lot of attention to the role of the default mode network right and controlling and controlling this this uh rapid and very fast all switching between internal thought and dealing with those things around you so, so to me that's that's actually the piece that, that the key piece that had to evolve is, is the ability to do that switching. And once you do that, then language is basically the ability to, starts with the ability to just label things. You know, initially you probably just label things sort of, you know, for convenience, for, for communication. But once you, once all the things that you see have labels, then you can start, and, and the labels themselves have their own, the words have their own attractors associated with them. Then you can connect those and your, your brain can go, can can follow a path of excitation through those words without them being, without, you know, those, those objects being in the room and without actually taking those actions that are, that are excited. And, that, and I think, you know, things take off exponentially from there. I mean, you have two papers in, in bioarchive and, and sort of that sort of is the, the second one, uh, example-based heavy and learning may be sufficient to support human intelligence. So how does this fit in with, with what exists in the field right now? I mean, are people, think, I mean, I'm certainly, people are trying to model this in some ways, but I mean, is it, I mean, you're, you're even talking even about things like um, a, a, a sort of a, re, a resetting of, not really resetting, but a, a thinking differently about what working memory actually is. Yeah, I think uh, obviously people have talked about associative networks, you know, for over 50 years. So yeah. the yeah. concept of associative networks has certainly been around for a long time. The concept of deep networks has been around for a long time. Um, I, I, I think there's a general impression that that it's maybe necessary to, the, the, to understand, um, you know, how a mouse works before you can understand how a human works. And that's that's one specific thing that I would like to challenge. I don't, I don't know if I've 
I don't think I've convinced anybody of that yet. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But I think, I think it's actually qualitatively different enough that th this, idea, this idea that human intelligence is built on, on a, a largely just a simple associative, I mean, conceptually simple associative network. I, I don't see people following that line right now. And, 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 and I think, and I think the, the reason is because people... Well, a couple of reasons. One is that that it's that you, you know it's it's not unreasonable to think that you have to understand mice before you, you can understand humans. Another strong thing is that you know that the artificial intelligence, you know, things that that are rivaling or sometimes beating humans are deep networks, right? So a lot of people point to that as evidence that, well, not evidence, but as uh, as you know, consistent with the idea that human intelligence should be should be deep networks. In fact, a lot of people, I mean, I think probably most people assume that, you know, like they, they just think that, you know, some, some simple associate network is just, just, you know, how could that be what's operating human intelligence when that's much, much simpler conceptually than what operates, what, what operates most of the things in, in a mouse. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a conceptual block that, that I personally think should be challenged. My sense is that, is that there are, I mean, I think that the deep old network construct is I, I actually sense it's it's might be shifting a little bit I, I've, I've heard the term associative network floated around a little bit more and, and so I mean it, it will be interesting to see I mean it's also interesting to think about you one thing one other thing that you had been talking about maybe a couple of years ago was uh, which is actually becoming quite a hot topic I think even recently in the context of a layer fMRI so you know what I do with layers uh, you know there's there is there's still an open question as to with EEG, for instance, measurements or even even ECOG, there's oscillatory activity of, you know, gamma frequencies, beta frequencies. People think gamma frequencies are output feed forward uh, activity. Beta is the feedback. It's obviously it's not that simple, but but people are trying to get their heads around uh, going from spiking to oscillation and it seems you need these attractors in this in this regard um, to to create that I, I think but and so so that was a uh, along the lines of maybe an earlier paper that that you were just developing as well sort of looking at oscillatory excitation dependent upon spike timing um, yeah um, yeah the, the, this the other paper that's that's on bioarchive um, in fact it was just uh, accepted at neurocomputation for okay. great is uh, is yes yeah, a little a sort of mechanical thing that that I came across when I you know was thinking about how these associative networks might be actually implemented. So what what I realized is, is that if and this to be more concrete, for example, if so if there's a if if an engram like if if a memory is encoded in the hippocampus, so you know a bunch of sensory stuff gets pre-processed and it it ends up exciting some subset of cells in the hippocampus. You know, it's, so it's generally thought that that over time, that memory is, uh, that, yeah, that engram is transported, is, is, is distributed broadly into this sparse thing that's in the cortex. So if the, if the hippocampus excites that, like say, say in sleep, does some replay by excite, exciting those cells, um, and if there are even just random connections between the hippocampus and the cortex, and but there, but those uh, cells are excited in an oscillating way. Then you, have, you know, with this, you have this, you have this oscillation that that gets broadcast as an os oscillation that the cortex sees. And if you have a periodic excitation of just a random set of neurons in the cortex, what that paper was was pointing out is that is that if there's just basic STDP mechanisms in play, then that will just naturally create. Um, a, a sparse distributed attractor in the cortex that's associated with that engram in the hippocampus. And it turns out that, you know, with STDP uh, time constants that seem to be like about what they are, like 20 milliseconds or so, um, the optimal frequency for that to happen at, the optimal in terms of efficiency of attractor production in the cortex is for the hippocampus to be broadcasting at around eight hertz or so. It, it, at theta sort of frequencies. Yeah. So that sort of sets an optimal uh, oscillation frequency for hippocampal training of the cortex. But then once that training happens, you have this, you have this, you know, distributed 
uh, set of neurons that sort of circularly uh, excite each other in, in the cortex. If you now let that run, just, you know, just simulated the exact same way, if you should excite that and let it run, it naturally oscillates at gamma frequencies, not theta frequencies. So, so that's where this conversion of frequencies occurs. And I'm not sure that there's any more design to it other than the fact that, you know, the STDB time constant happens to be about 20 milliseconds. And that, that means that the optimal frequencies in the theta band for this, this creation, and then if you just look at, you know, like, like path length and conduction velocities and stuff like that, if you just calculate what those, those attractors in the brain will oscillate at, it's, it turns out to be, you know, 30, 40 Hertz. Okay. Which is, so, yeah. you know, gamma frequencies. And the other thing that interesting thing that, that does is the fact that the frequency increases makes it so that the same STD P mechanism can actually associate attractors with each other. Because they've because they've accelerated, that makes that that process, um, you know, so it makes it so that you can do rapid oscillations of one that can cause um, it, it, the time constants are such that the same STP mechanism with the same time constant will now uh, can can now connect um, uh, attractors with one another. So what I really like about this is that it's more than I mean it's sort of once again and and this is sort of starting back at the beginning of our, of the, of the interview is that, um, you know, you're sort of taking these elements of first principles, you know, time constants of, of neurons and trying to extrapolate to things that are measurable in some way. And, and to try to explain, a, you know, these, you know, sort of triangulating between what's known and first principles to sort of advance a knowledge, which I think, you know, I actually think that, that, not many people, I, I actually don't think that a lot of people do that. And I think it takes a lot of confidence and courage, you know, because obviously people will easily, you know, always say, oh, well, what about this? What about this? You know, pull codes, holes in it. But, but at the same time, it's sort of putting something out there that at least is tying together. And also importantly, it's tying together a phenomena like memory and sleep and uh, reconsolidation with a mechanism. And that's what the field obviously needs a lot more is sort of mechanisms. And they, they could be wrong. I mean, all models, you know, what, what did somebody say? Who said that? All models are wrong. Some are useful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and it's true. I mean, so you're having a model so as your foothold of, of trying to then, you know, either advance it theoretically or further or, or try to, to make some sort of further triangulation with data. Yeah. So that's, that's great. This is, I mean, I'm, this is really exciting. I, I, you know, obviously I, I, I really, really like ex, um, talking about this with you. Uh, uh, in general. Uh, and I think I, I'm just wondering, um, so right. So sort of like going off of like AI, going off of those, uh, those models, going off of what, what the field is sort of trying to do right now. Are you hopeful that will, that will figure out the brain or, or that we will at least understand it well enough to explain it in a mechanistic way? Um, um. I think, I mean, you know, I, I'm probably still very naive in the sense, but like, like I said, I, I think that the human specific part is actually, there's a good chance that it's actually very relatively straightforward. I think it'll be, you know, and, and I think, you know, like, like deep hierarchical networks are actually pretty good models of things like the visual stream, right? And, you know, the, I think those, those areas that evolved over, you know, many millions of years, you know, the, the brains the evolution will have pulled out like every trick in the book to make those things work. And disentangling that stuff is, is to me, sounds really hard. And, you know, there's, there's probably a limit, ultimately a limited degree to which we'll be able to do that. But I think, you know, I think both the most satisfying and probably the most useful for, you know, for humans is to, is to understand the human specific parts, because at least like, you know, most psychiatric disorders, you know, like OCD and schizophrenia and things like that. Those are, those are disorders that I think are, I think are pretty, pretty well confined to the human specific parts of cognition. So if we actually understand that, that mechanistically, I think that will be, you know, quite satisfying to most people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and right. I mean, it might be able to, you know, reveal some sort of biomarkers or some sort of something, some sort of interventions that are possible as well. I mean, you know, the bottom line is to try to, right, understand the brain, but also clinical applications. And you don't need to understand it fully to, 
have some sort of inroads that way. Yeah. So, so what do you see as your as your future? Um, you know, as far as MR is concerned, or uh, or or as far as your research in in um, computational. Well, yeah. So personally, I think computational modeling will be will be certainly the next phase. So you know, one possible path is that that all the ideas I have so wrong are, so far are wrong and they just retire. <laughs> That's one possible path. <laughs> <laughs> and do something else. You know, another another possible path is that that some of them actually uh, make some sense and are worth following. You know, from a computational point of view, um, right now they're they're sort of uh, sort of mechanistically low enough level that they they don't they don't yet um, interface much. I, I think with most of fMRI type scale stuff, right? Um, uh, or actually, even you know. At the other end of the scale, cellular level stuff. I think they're they're sort of middle scale. Like they they basically, is, you know, assuming there's STDP and and you know a, a neuron is a node, you can get a long way in in uh, in computational modeling of the the kinds of things that I envision. So did, um, just really quickly, um, do yeah. these things scale up? So this is a question I've had. You know, like for instance, you were talking about these networks of, you know, these these attractor states of, you know, maybe. 10 to 100 neurons or whatever, but yeah. I mean, but how does that even explain, you know, let's say you have EEG and you have this coherent frequencies you know, that average across big swaths of the brain. So what's, how, how does it scale in that regard to give that um, sort of signal? Yeah, so I, I think, uh, so even for the human brain where there's obviously a lot, lot of neurons, if you, if you think about how many, uh, you know, how many attractors you, you likely have, how many, you know, which is basically all the engrams, all the memories, and all the things, which is basically like all the words. There's there's certainly hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of attractors that you should have if you know under this model. Um, and that that means that each attractor is actually only you know thousands of neurons. Okay. And, and their and their and their connections. I guess that's true. I guess so. It's, it's actually not that. It's it's not that. Um, like the scale is actually not that far off from from what you can calculate with with, a, with simple simulations. So I, you know, so an attractor. So the thing that represents, you know, a very specific thing, you know, like a eraser to you, certainly collect connected to a lot of other other things. You know, a lot of engrams that involve erasers and and all kinds of stuff. But you know, the the, the fundamental, the basic, you know, eraser attractor could be only thousands of neurons. And it's across a spatial scale. That's microscopic, or is it somehow distributed, or is it like is um, it so, that it's all yeah. it's so it's so yeah. linked to other attractors that I th I think um, I think there's I think it's both. Um, I think one of the reasons that we can like I mean we, we clearly can can link any any tractor to any other tractor. I mean like you know like Pavlov showed that that you can link you know a bell to you know meat meat thoughts. Um, so I, I think there's, I think, you know, the ability to link anything to anything means that uh, a lot of, that, 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 that fundamentally attractors are very broadly distributed. So like your eraser attractor, I think is, is probably a set of cells that, that, you know, are sprinkled across your entire frontal lobe. And, and I think, uh, you know, most things will have very distributed representations so that they can, um, so that anything can be associated with anything, which is which I think is a pretty general property of human knowledge. But at the same time, there there are categories that are tight enough, and so like one example is is face recognition, where right. there's obviously you know this very focused area that that does that. So at some point, you know there 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 it would make sense to have specialized circuits that make make very specific decisions. So the face face area is a good example of that because it's like it. It, its job is to make this very specific uh, decision and have have uh, you know horizontal inhibition of of all other faces. When you decide this is Joe, then Joe needs to inhibit all other you know. It has you have, you have to have a clear, fast decision. So so there are things that are specialized enough that I think it makes sense for the brain to have set aside real estate to collect all the information from context sight and sounds and everything and and bring them to the face area to make that decision so i think there's there's both 
uh, very sparsely distributed, very broadly distributed, and good reason for specialization in, in you know, for specific things. That's a compelling construct that that I haven't heard, you know, sort of described in that in that sort of way. So it'd be really cool to, you know, try to work on either ways of, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's really hard. With fMRI, you, you can, the, the only technique that can look at the whole brain is, you know, either techniques that are really low resolution or even a little bit higher with fMRI, but still you're, it's sort of blobby and you can't really get at this, um, but who knows? I mean, you know, the what Nico Kragas already sort of pioneered, sort of looking at pattern effect mapping, sort of looking at patterns of fMRI as being unique. It's still a million, millions of voxels, but it's still suggestive that there are these unique patterns that are sort of loosely associated with these areas, but still sort of unique to specific types of stimuli as well. So, I mean, anyway, it's just, yeah, it'd be nice to sort of bridge this a little bit more, either through yep. theoretically or, you know, trying to model this at, at, at scale, maybe, <laughs> um, or, or just getting at it uh, using other well thought out experiments. Yeah. I mean, another, another, well, to me, another sort of key aspect of this, the, the type of model that I'm thinking about is, is um, the role of uh, attention. You know, and that's that's an area where fMRI obviously has um, a long history and and can make observations that are that are that they're rich. And I, to, I I think for for this kind of associative model to actually do something close to what what a human train of thought does, there has to be well obviously there are attention mechanisms, but but the, the I think the simplest way to to think of how that might work mechanistically is. If there's if there's just mechanisms for that like the, the top handful of attractors that are that are excited at any moment to just just mutually inhibit all other ones yeah like if it's, if it's just like a you know like choose the top seven attractors <clears throat> and and raise their activity level or or suppress the activity level of everybody else then then those those seven are they're, they're they, they have your attention they I mean it's it, like in my simple way of thinking them thinking about it, those are actually those seven attractors are there. Um, they were they were they were filtered. I mean, they were they were selected by attention mechanisms, but they're also the things that are subject to. There are the things that you uh, are aware, are consciously aware of, and they're also the things that are subject to um, uh, recording by the hippocampus. So to me, those are all. Those are all, probably all. If they're not very close, they're the same thing. Okay, very close so you're thing. saying so. That's actually no, another sort of you know leap in some sense of of association of you know saying you know, and it's actually interesting. I mean, we have this thing called working memory that uh, it, you know. Yeah, it could be as simple as that. Right. So yeah. it's you know five seven plus or minus two. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah. and and you and you can imagine working memory just being seven attractors or the number of attractors that your attention is focused on. Yeah. And, and all that would be required for that is for the, um, you know, the dynamics of those, of the attractor mechanisms to have a, a long enough time constant so that, so that seven ish are, you know, are, are active enough to, to, you know, to, 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 to be part of what's in your attention fields. At any at any one time, yeah, and that, it's also required for, you know, like if, if you have just an associative uh, network that's that's described by you know a graph, the the like if if the dynamics of the network is just like that that connectivity matrix, you know, applied to every activity vector at any time point, the dynamics of that, if everything's linear, is very non-interesting, right? It's it's completely described by just you know the eigenvectors of that connectivity matrix and you you know it, it's very difficult to, to create a a connectivity matrix that has more than a handful of stable states and all and it's just it's it's you know extremely far away from what we do in terms of what the dynamics would be but the simple step of, of adding a, a, you know a, a very gross nonlinearity like just choosing top seven changes the dynamics of that from something that's very structured and very sort of not interesting to something that's very, very much right at the edge of chaos if with, the, with the right sort of 
um, weights and stuff like that. So you can have, so what, what I think of as your train of thought is the sort of this collection of a handful of uh, attractors that are, that are lit up and they will wander through a space in a, in a, in a, in, in a path that's very much right on the edge of chaotic, which I think is what our train of thought mostly is. Right. Um, and so, so I think that the attention mechanism is, is, is critical for the, the, you know, for human, like for train of thought, like dynamics in, in that kind of, um, is, is necessary for, for, for a train of thought, like dynamics in that kind of, um, associative model. And it, and it might also have something to do with, right, how, how quickly we do have to respond in the environment as well. Like how, what's the time constant of things happening in the environment, sure. um, coupled with the temporal limitations of, of neuronal connection in that regard. But it's fun to talk about this. And it's fun because, you know, I'm sort of, I'm, I mean, it's fun for me, at least, because I'm kind of an amateur, and I just like talking to you and uh, about about this type of thing. And I think, and I actually think it's more important than that. I'm not only, I'm, I'm, experience in brain imaging enough to know, uh, to feel like this is, that this is what you're doing is, is in the middle of sort of like trying to bridge this gap of, of trying to have mechanistic explanations that, that make sense, that are a little bit beyond, um, like you're, what you're saying, this intermediate scale of explanation that, that we haven't quite got it yet. And I think, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's many people making progress, and and I think it, it it the field needs all the creativity and rigor as it can get. And I think, yeah, definitely. I mean, right. I think like what I'm actually, you know, all, all this stuff is obviously just just guessing, and I'm doing you know computational simulations and stuff. Um, what I'm fairly convinced of is that there is is that in in human specific intelligence, there's a large a large aspect of uh, just associative memory. I mean, just the fact that that you can that your that what you know is largely describable in in a linear set of words, and most sentences that you'll say to people just describes one association for the most part. You know, like dogs of fur is you know is just tells a person to associate their dog attractor with their fur attractor. You know, if you think about the things that you learn the 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 huge majority are things that are that, that you can just imagine just wiring up, you know, one or more association into a person's brain. Yeah. Um, but so the, so, I mean, I, I'm still, I still would push maybe at least for myself, push back a little yeah. because it seems that, you know, right. Humans do this association efficiently. They have, they have ways of categorizing and they have language, but I would almost argue that experiencing the world you, you have to, I mean, it seems like all the way down, all the way down to worms in some sense, you, there has to be some type. I mean, certainly you can only program with DNA so much, and then you have to experience the world to tune that, yeah. in that regard. And, and it seems that that sort of is close enough to the concept of association in some regard that with humans, it's, it's much more, it's like an, uh, an order of magnitude more efficient because we have coding, you know, coding of, 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 of the world in some sense that we can maybe manipulate it better or work with it better. But it seems that all life with a, with a brain that moves or communicates or whatever, seems like that that's, it's a continuum potentially, uh, at least for yeah. us. Yeah, so certainly that's true. I mean, but if, if you look at like, you know, like a, like a, a draft being born and then, you know, walking five minutes later yes you know, there's there's so much that's pre-wired um even in you know even in you know high level mammals um that it's that it, it's uh you know that that i mean it's amazing that the genes can do that but um you know a lot of that stuff is is somehow magically pre-wired in ways that uh, I, don't, I don't know if we'll be able to figure out but but the yeah i mean but the part the part that we add at least I haven't seen where it's where it, what we had needs to be complicated. Now it's it's not that those it's not that those seven things that are in your attention are the only things that are active. You know, like like you always have like the the, the part that you think of as like intuitive thought, intuitive human thought. You know that that's still manipulating all these attractors that we learned. Uh, you know, by labeling things and 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 it's still using the whole network of of associations that that we've wired up. 
Well, I, I would even argue, I, I, yeah, I would even argue that that's potentially, I was just talking to Maurizio Cabetta, who had this paper on why do we have the resting state now? Why do we have um, resting state activity? And it seems that that's, it seems like it might be all these, act, all these networks being constantly jostled and primed and optimizing themselves. And, and, it, that, and that's going on below conscious thought. Uh, in, in some in some way, potentially, um, some of it, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, I at least in, in within the framework of the, this model that I'm thinking of, sort of that that selection of things for attention is it it it, it adds a, it, an interesting nonlinearity that, that changes the, the dynamics. Certainly, um, it you know it may have this function of of just you know picking the cream of the crop so that only the top few things are encoded in episodic memory. But I think, um, you know, the, the, there's there's processing that's both above and below that line. And the things that are above that line actually are constantly changing, right? And like, you're, you're, I mean, you're, your train of thought is sort of by definition, the fact that those are constantly changing. But so that, so the, the things that are subconscious are, are, they're all, you know, there's, there's a very rich dynamics of things that are exciting one another below it. And in fact, in, in a sense, they're all sort of, not fighting, but they're they're all jostling around, and and some and they 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 bubble up, you know, in some in some funny sequence as well. So I think I think the the, the conscious versus subconscious, at least within this context, is is a little bit arbitrary, and that it's it's just you know these 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 top seven or whatever are labeled conscious because they because they grab your attention, and the, and the ones that are below don't at, at that moment, but they will, you know, they might the next moment. Yeah, that's a really cool. I mean, to me at least, that's a really compelling way of thinking about that. And and it'll be really interesting to see if anyone else sort of picks up in this and sort of says, "Oh, yeah, there's there's maybe some exper- more empirical evidence." And yeah, and um, I think I think we're on the edge, uh, you know, the field in some sense, it's on the edge of something crystallizing in this regard. Uh, that that was sort of kind of be the beginning of like, oh yeah, that, and then a cascade of understanding will. Will come through yeah. uh, as far as that's concerned so you know one can only hope and uh, yeah yeah no that, that would be cool and yeah and certainly the uh, one of the goals of people like you and i perhaps is to be a, a part of that <laughs> yeah yeah or to try to foster in any way and maybe add something here and there this is great um i think we covered uh so much and and i also think you know maybe you know we can talk again but um uh in a future time but because i you know i think i think it would it's what's what's fun about talking to you to you at least for myself is that um is is, is that it's sort of like you know we you know um you sort of just sort of try to you know i think that and many people do this and and it, what's what's fun to me is that you just you you listen to what's said and then you just uh it seems like you put things together in in a in an original way quickly and 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 ideas sort of sort of flow and i and i enjoy that a lot so like I said, we could talk for much longer. I do want to uh, just mention that uh, I think that I think that uh, yeah, I think actually what you're doing as far as uh, the neuroscience component is is exciting, and and I think that right there are ideas coming together, and I actually think that for both of us, um, we've been very lucky as far as you know. There's a lot of serendipity in our careers in the field whatever. And I think that sort of coming together, you know, sort of having the right environment to, to build grading coils to program scanners and, and do fMRI right when the field was, you know, just emerging uh, was a lucky thing. And, and I'm really fortunate to, right, to have been working with you otherwise. And I really, it's important to emphasize that uh, MCW wouldn't, wouldn't have had echo planner um, in this sort of way. And it, it wouldn't really have been where it was, uh, with regard to fMRI, if it, if it weren't for your work, um, so I really I want to make sure I acknowledge that before the end uh, end again, and and to thank you for helping the field, and 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 also to to wish you you know, right. I think that's it's a hard it's hard to penetrate neuroscience, <laughs> and and I, and I and if anyone can do it well, uh, it's you. Thanks a lot. Thanks thanks very much for for having me on. It's been it's been fun talking. Neurosalience is brought to you by the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This week's episode was produced by Ekaterina Dobrikova and 
Alfie Wang.